Well, good morning, everyone. So glad you're here. Welcome today. Let's go ahead and stand as we sing A Mighty Fortress is Our God. A mighty fortress is our God. Good morning, church. We welcome you this morning, Sunday, August the 2nd, to the chapel in Marlboro. We are grateful to have in our presence today, Luke Witte. Luke is a longtime friend, a former attender of our church and pastor in the Alliance area who now resides in Charlotte, North Carolina. He's been coming to our church now annually for the past several years. We've been looking forward to this Sunday. Luke, it's good to have you and uh, may God bless you as you minister here at the chapel today. We have two big outdoor opportunities coming up during the month of August. On Sunday afternoon, August 16th at three o'clock p.m., our deacons are sponsoring a church picnic and they are taking the responsibility for this. All you have to do is show up and bring a dessert and everything else is provided for you. That's Sunday, August the 16th, 
3 o'clock p.m. Bring your dessert and come to the church pavilion for a church picnic. And along with picnicking, there will be a few casual uh, activities such as horseshoes or cornhole and things like that. That's Sunday, August 16th. And then for the men of the church, and again, we define the men's ministry as freshmen in high school and older, guys on Sunday evening, August 30, we're having our annual cookout. This is a great opportunity not only for you to come, but to invite one of your friends. We ask you to bring your own meat, grilling will be done, and the church provides all the fixings. So you bring your meat, whatever your meat of choice is, and buy one for your friend. And then the church provides the fixings. And our speaker this year is Pastor Tom Edwards. That's Sunday, August 30, 5 o'clock p.m., the annual men's cookout. On page two of your bulletin, you will notice that we are looking for teachers in our children's area and helpers for Awana on Wednesday night. We do hope that Awana will start up again in September, but we need your help. Our Sunday school needs your help. Our jam ministry needs your help. If you have a love for children and are willing to help teach them, please contact the people listed in the bulletin or see me and we'll give you a ministry, one of the most important ministries in all of the church, working with our children and training them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Mondays from 6.30 to 8.30 is our Celebrate Recovery. Celebrate Recovery is a great ministry that helps people struggling with issues in life. And so that's Monday, 6.30 to 8.30 at the Source Cafe. Now, I'm very proud to say that on Monday, August the uh, 3rd, Celebrate Recovery will be celebrating its second anniversary. And we praise God for what has happened in changing the lives of people for the better. If you're interested in Celebrate Recovery, call either Ed or Kim Mitchell and learn about this wonderful ministry God has given us here at the chapel. Thank you again for being here today. We trust that God will bless you as we worship him. May Jesus Christ be praised. Well, unfortunately, Luke Whitty is not with us today, but let's go ahead and stand in worship anyways. Let's sing together. Wow. 
presence there is freedom in your presence we are made whole in your presence found in you found in you jesus every victory is found in you found in you all we want and all we need is found in you found in you jesus every victory is found in you found in you
for your mercy, your goodness. And we love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's go ahead and have our seat. And at this time, jam kids, we're going to dismiss you out to your jam class. Well, thank you, Matt. I had my mic on mute earlier, Jack, so you may need to adjust the sound a little. I'll ramble on just a little here while you do that. I didn't quite know what Matt meant when he said, unfortunately, Luke Whitty is not here today. I guess that means he has to put up with me for another Sunday. I'll be speaking to him later this week about his choice of words on that. Uh, wet noodle, right. That's Joe Moore's. I always tell Joe... I'm going to flog him with 40 lashes with a wet noodle if he doesn't behave himself. So he doesn't feel very threatened by that. All right. Our scripture reading today, if you have a bulletin, our scripture reading is in the, in the bulletin. And because of the, the length of it, I'm going to read it to you. But I will ask you to stand, please, as we read God's Word from 2 Kings 4, 1 through 7, the English Standard Version. Now the wife of one of the sons of the prophets cried to Elisha, Your servant, my husband, is dead, and you know that your servant feared the Lord, but the creditor has come to take my two children to be his slaves. And Elisha said to her, What shall I do for you? Tell me, what have you in the house? And she said, Your servant has nothing in the house except a jar of oil. Then he said, Go outside, borrow vessels from all your neighbors, empty vessels and not too few. Then go in and shut the door behind yourself and your sons and pour into all these vessels. And when one is full, set it aside. So she went from him and shut the door behind herself and her sons. And as she poured, they brought the vessels to her. When the vessels were full, she said to her son, Bring me another vessel. And he said to her, There is not another. Then the oil stopped flowing. She came and told the man of God, and he said, Go sell the oil and pay your debts, and you and your sons can live on the rest. Thank you. You may be seated, and may God add his blessing to the reading of his own holy word. I want to do a brief series this month on prayer. And we'll be returning to our text momentarily. But as I do this series, I want to begin with the thought taken from this text that God is generous. God is generous. 
We serve a generous God. His nature is one of generosity. Dr. Charles Allen, a man whom I admire and a leader of the church from a previous generation now in heaven, led uh, one of the largest, in fact, the largest Methodist congregation for years, First United Methodist Church of Houston, Texas. Dr. Allen was a Bible-believing, gospel-preaching man. Dr. Allen made this remark. The main job of the church is to teach people to pray. Uh, that's an interesting statement, isn't it? The main job of the church is to teach people to pray. I would like to take that remark and add upon it by saying that when we pray, we learn firsthand through experience of the generous nature of God. In 1963, Leith Anderson, retired pastor from Minnesota, writes, a college student was visiting friends in Wisconsin before the start of the summer term at the University of Minnesota. He sensed something was wrong, but didn't know what it was or what to do. He prayed and asked for God's wisdom and direction. He experienced God's answer to abandon his school plans and immediately drive to his parents' home in New Jersey. He drove a thousand miles alone, striving, or arriving with little explanation of his behavior. The next day, he became seriously ill with measles. Had he gone to Minnesota, he would not only have missed school, but faced sickness without family or any place to go. The incubation period for the disease dated back to the time of his prayer and of God's answer. A Muslim convert to Christianity received a telephone call in 1990 that his neighborhood was on fire and his house soon would burn. He rushed from his government office to see the flames closing in. There was time to save only his most precious belongings, and when he ran into his house, he salvaged a mattress. Standing outside, surrounded by the Muslim neighbors who had persecuted him, he lifted his hands and voice and prayed out loud in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, asking God to intervene and save his home. When he finished with, in Jesus' name, amen, thunder boomed. Suddenly, rains poured and the flames were extinguished. The neighbors were impressed. One very rainy fall in Colorado, the fields were too muddy for the farmers to harvest the sugar beets. The late date risked total loss of the crop. More rain was forecast. A young pastor visited the farms of his parishioners and prayed for God to intervene and dry the ground. The night, the Denver weatherman announced a surprise change in the storm system affecting the area. Instead of rain, there would be dry winds. The fields quickly dried and the harvest was completed on time. A young Minnesota mother with stage 3 ovarian cancer prayed for healing in 1993. Her advanced disease was being treated with chemotherapy. God said yes, moving her dangerous disease into re remission. I know the Bible is true. I heard the Muslim convert story firsthand in his native land. I was the college student. I was the pastor in Colorado. The 33-year-old mother is part of the church in Minnesota I have now served for 20 years. The list of answers to prayer is long, not just from the Bible and my experiences, but from millions of others around the world and through the centuries. I love it every time. God answers prayer. This is 
the testimony of Leith Anderson. But this is also the testimony of Charles Allen, of George Mueller, of whom you'll hear in a moment, of Charles Haddon Spurgeon, of Dwight L. Moody, of Martin Luther, whose famous hymn, A Mighty Fortress, we sang earlier in this service, of the disciples of Jesus, of the early church, and a pattern expressed by the Lord Jesus Christ himself in his earthly ministry and sojourn. God hears and answers prayer, and God is a generous God. I heard of a pastor who owned a talking parrot, but all the parrot could say was, let us pray, let us pray, let us pray. One day as he was making the rounds of his church, he learned from one of his deacons that the deacon also owned a talking parrot. But all the deacon's parrot could say was, let us kiss, let us kiss, let us kiss. And so the pastor said, why don't we get our parrots together and maybe they'll learn a broader vocabulary. And so they thought that was a good idea. So the pastor took his parrot over and put it in the cage with the deacon's parrot and the pastor's parrot said, let us pray, let us pray, let us pray. And the deacon's parents, parrot said, let us kiss, let us kiss, let us kiss. And the pastor's parrot said, my prayers have been answered. <laughs> well, God does answer prayer because he is a generous God. Someone has said that for many Christians, prayer is like a spiritual airbag. And then this person went on to write that in his automobile's owner's manual, there is this statement about the frontal airbags. Frontal airbags are designed to be deployed in moderate to severe crashes. And the only time we utilize prayer is when we experience a personal moderate or severe crash. Is that true of you? The heart of God says, I am generous. And Philippians 4.19, taken from the New Testament, reminds us that my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. That's quite a statement. My God shall supply all your need because he's rich. And he'll supply it by Christ Jesus. And his nature is one of generosity. Well, let's begin this series by defining prayer as something not to be understood as complex. In its simplest mode of understanding, prayer is conversation with God. We simply converse with God, and we can do that. In fact, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, we are told to pray without ceasing. Obviously, the Apostle Paul could not have done that, nor could he have uh, really in good conscience commanded it if he didn't do it himself, for he was a man on the go. If he understood prayer to be something from which we withdraw from others and withdraw from society and do nothing except be in the presence of God. But he understood that we're in the presence of God at all time, and we can companion through the Holy Spirit with the living God at always. Dr. Robert Cook, who was for many years president of the King's College, and at that time, Briarcliff Manor, New York, now it is in downtown New York City, Manhattan area, actually. But uh, Dr. Cook used to say 
that in this idea of praying always, that we simply recognize God's presence, that he's present with us. And so in his own practice, whenever the phone would ring, he'd simply say, Lord, give me the wisdom to handle this conversation properly. When a letter would come and he had to answer it, Lord, give me, give me the wisdom or the grace to answer this letter in a way that honors Christ. When it was time to leave his office, Lord, thank you for a good day that you've given me. May I take a proper attitude home. And when he is at home, Lord, thank you for the home you've provided and the family that is here. Just these little prayers to God. I call them bullet prayers. Just a, Lord, help me now. Lord, bless me now. Lord, give me grace now. Lord, give me wisdom now. Lord, give me a knowledge now of the, the subject that's going to be discussed. May I do what is right. May I say what is wise and may I glorify Christ. This morning we want to think about God's generous spirit. Our scripture reading from 2 Kings 4 takes us into the days of Elisha, a day of apostasy in Judah and Israel a time when people had wondered from God and God, true to his word, had promised, if you walk away from me, expect the worst. I will withhold rain. There will be famine. Oppressors will enter the land. And these things had happened. These were not happy times or happy days for Israel. But Elisha's predecessor, Elijah, had formed a college, so to speak, of the prophets. <coughs> Young men who were set upon by the Spirit of God and who knew the law of Moses and wished to return Israel to the paths of truth and of righteousness. And they studied the lives of Elijah and Elisha and chose to emulate those lives and proclaim those messages in a desire to bring Israel back to the living God, Jehovah, the Lord. Unfortunately, as is true in all of life, some of these young men became ill and died prematurely, and that happens. And this one prophetic student left behind a wife and two children. Being a student then was not much different from being a student now. There isn't a whole lot to go around, and Elisha comes, and his widow cries and says, Your servant, my husband, has died. You know that your servant feared the Lord, a phrase that means he observed the ways of God. He did what God wanted him to do. Elisha, he wasn't a wasteful individual. We have absolutely nothing except a little flask of oil. But he didn't waste what we had. He didn't just blow it on things. He followed the ways of the Lord, but we have nothing. We have nothing except a debt. And if I don't pay that debt, our creditor has threatened to come and take the kids and make them work as slaves to him until the debt is paid off. And who knows when that debt will be paid off? Who knows if I'll ever see the kids again? Will you help me? Can you do something? Well, Elisha knows something we need to be reminded of. He knew the generous nature of God. And what is his instruction to her? What have you got in the house? Just a jar of oil. 
And some of the Bible translations say a flask, just a bottle of oil, small bottle of that. Well, I'll tell you what you do. You see, widow lady, wife of the prophetic student who died prematurely, leaving you with two children to feed and nothing with which to feed them. You see, I know the generous nature of God. And because I am his prophet, I am here to proclaim that generous nature to you. Send the boys out into the neighborhood and get all the empty vessels and flasks you can. I can assure you, at this time in Israel's history, there would have been many of them. Because the people were just hanging on by a thread. So the boys come back, the neighbor's empty vessels, the people down the street, their empty vessels, the farmer up the road, his empty vessels. Here they are, Mom. And she pours some oil from her flask into an empty vessel. The oil keeps coming. The oil keeps coming. The oil keeps coming. The flask is full. Set it aside. Hand me another one of those empty vessels. Man, that one's a pot. It keeps flowing. It keeps flowing. It keeps flowing. It's full. And on and on it goes until all the vessels that they've been able to find are full. And then, drip, drip, stop. The oil stops flowing. She's got enough oil to feed the village. But She's going to sell it and pay off the debt. God has provided for her. Now, if this episode from the life of Elisha in 2 Kings does not remind you of our Lord Jesus Christ feeding the 5,000, well, it should. Because there again, the generous nature of God found in the Lord Jesus Christ, the God-man, is expressed when Jesus looks upon this throng of 5,000 men. And there may have been women and children, we don't know, but 5,000 men. And he sees that they are hungry. How are we going to feed these men, he asks. And one of his disciples says, well, there's a lad here with five biscuits and two little sardines. But what is that among so many? Well, bring him here. I've often wondered when I've read that episode in the life of Jesus, five loaves it's called and, and two fish, but they were rather small. It was his lunch that his mama had fixed for him. I wonder how he would have related that story later in his life, how he would have regaled people by telling them, when I was a kid, Jesus called me up and he took my lunch and, you know, he reached into my basket and he started passing out a fish and a biscuit, a fish and a biscuit to everybody there. And that just kept coming, it just kept coming, it just kept coming until all 5,000 had been fed. Jesus taught me of the generous nature of God, and I've never forgotten it. Well, as I shared with you earlier, Pastor Leith Anderson never forgot it either. There is another individual we might want to remember by the name of George Mueller. George Mueller was an interesting man, 1805 to 1895, as I recall. I'm not quite sure on those dates, but I think that's correct. Mueller's diary or autobiography is still available in print. Here was a man who knew how to pray. An interesting fellow, I dug out this information on Mueller. A Christian evangelist and director of the Ashley Down Orphanage in Bristol, England. He was also a founder of the Plymouth Brethren Movement. He cared for over 10,000 orphans during his lifetime. 
Don't forget that people used to push their kids out into the street if they couldn't take care of them. Uh, John Wesley began orphanages today in Western civilization as a result of the Christian influence and the influence of the church. Orphanages are commonly found as tax-supported institutions, but they began as Christian ministry. Mueller cared for 10,000 orphans during his lifetime. He provided educational opportunities for the orphans, educational opportunity. He taught them how to read and write and do math to the point that he was even accused of some of raising the poor above their natural station in British life. He established 117 schools which offered Christian education to more than 120,000 children. But he personally saw that over 10,000 were fed and clothed and sheltered and raised in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. When Mueller began, he made it known that he would never advertise the needs he had in caring for this orphanage and these children and later the schools that arose. Rather, he would take these matters to God in prayer. And through prayer, God met the needs of George Mueller and of the many orphans he raised and the children he trained. It was all done through prayer, which takes us to the remark that Jesus made in Matthew chapter 7, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it will be opened unto you. George Mueller had tapped into the generous nature of God by asking, seeking, and knocking. In about 1875, 10 or 12 years before he went on to heaven to be with Jesus, an elderly man, a Christian man, boarded a steamer in Bristol, England, his name, George Mueller. He was crossing to America because American churches had heard of his ministry and wanted to hear from him and meet him and duplicate some of what he had done in England or maybe duplicate all of what he had done for, in England for the orphans and the poor children in the American cities. He had arranged to meet with a group of pastors in Boston, Massachusetts at noon on a given day. The steamer, some miles out from Boston, ran into a heavy, thick fog, and the engines were shut down. Mueller came up on deck and found the captain, and he said, hey, what's going on? And the captain said, the fog is so thick we cannot continue. We have to sit here until the fog raises. And Mueller said, but I'm supposed to be in Boston tomorrow for a noon meeting. And the captain said, well, I'm sorry, sir, but there's no way. No way we will ever be in Boston tomorrow. You'll have to land and then rearrange your meeting. And Mueller said, well, we'll see about that. And there in the captain's presence, he fell to his knees and he prayed, Lord, you know I've got a meeting with the Boston area pastors tomorrow at noon, and it's very important that I keep it. Lord, raise this fog, raise this fog so we can continue. And within moments of finishing his prayer, the captain saw the fog raising, and it became clear and the captain gave the order, full steam ahead. They landed in Boston Harbor the next morning. And leaving the steamer at about 11 o'clock with an hour to go before his meeting, Mueller thanked the captain for his services and the captain said, Mr. Mueller, 
I think I'm going to have to start praying. And Mueller said, Sir, first you must know the one to whom you pray. The generous nature of God. Do you know this God? Have you tapped into his generous nature? Are you aware as we've looked at 2 Kings chapter 4 and as I've related to you the episode from George Mueller or even from Leith Anderson that prayer teaches us of our limitations but also of God's unlimited power and breadth in his ability to answer for our needs. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in Christ Jesus. God's power is unlimited. Christ displayed this for us in his life, not only demonstrating in Matthew chapter 8 that he possesses the divine attributes, but also demonstrating that he cares about us, Matthew 8. And when Jesus got into the boat, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great storm on the sea, so that the boat was being swamped by the waves. Now, that would be rather frightening. And the disciples got frightened. But Jesus was asleep. And so the disciples went and woke him, saying, Save us, Lord. We are about to perish. And no doubt they were. And Jesus said to them, Why are you afraid, O you of little faith? Then he arose, and he rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. And the men marveled, saying, What sort of man is this that even winds and sea obey him? And of course we know the answer. The type of man he is is the son of of the living God. God is inclined to answer our prayer for those who give him the glory. Let's remember as we think about the widow of Elisha's day, whose vessel is filled and then whose neighbor's vessels she's borrowed are filled, that we too are vessels. In fact, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7 uses this very term in referring to us as human beings. 2 Corinthians 4 says, we have this treasure, that's the gospel, that's the knowledge of God, that's our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We have this treasure in earthen vessels, that speaks of our body. That speaks of you and me. We have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. God is willing to fill us with his presence. God is willing to fill us with his spirit. God is a generous God. And as we pray to him and as we seek him and as we seek to glorify him, we can rest assured our prayers are answered, and they will be. And we'll be talking about some, some of those answers later in this series. But today I want us to understand God is a generous God who hears and who answers our prayers. Do we understand this? Can we say yes to the truth of God's generous nature? Have you yourself received from the generous hand of God a gift of an answer to prayer? In 1 Thessalonians 5.17, as I've said, we are instructed to pray without ceasing, which means that we recognize God's consistent and constant presence in our lives. He is there. He companions with us. And we can make prayer a habit, and we should. 
make prayer a habit? Someone has said, one of the commentaries, 1 Thessalonians 5.17, pray without ceasing means prayer is to be repeated frequently. And again, my phrase is a bullet prayer. Lord, help me in this situation. Lord, give me wisdom. I've been in situations with other people where I felt very uncomfortable and felt like I wanted to speak up for Christ and wasn't quite sure what to do or what to say. And I'm sharing this just as my personal experience. I've retreated in my spirit to prayer and not knowing exactly what to pray or what to say, I really say the Lord's Prayer, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And it has a very calming influence on me. George Washington Carver was perhaps the greatest scientist in the first half of the 20th century. He certainly was the greatest black scientist. George Washington Carver has an interesting story. It's well worth reading. Uh, born into slavery, he was, as was commonly done back in the days of slavery in the southern part of our nation, just given one name. His name was Carver. Similar to the way our pets are named, uh, our dog is Sally, our cat is Jimmy or whatever. Carver was his name. At the conclusion of the American Civil War and during the period of restoration, George, uh, rather Carver, was empowered and enabled to go to school. And so he went to school. And when he went to school, uh, the teacher who was a white lady and who was teaching the black children how to read and write and get along in life, asked him, and what is your name? And he said, Carver, ma'am. She said, well, what is your full name? He said, I don't know what you mean by a full name. My name is Carver. And she said, well, you're going to have to take a full name. That means you have a first name, you have a middle name, and you have a last name. And he looked up, and there behind the teacher was a picture of George Washington. <laughs> and he said, my name is George Washington Carver, ma'am. And that's what she wrote down. And he became George Washington Carver. Well, he rolled up his shirt sleeves. He went to work. And as a youngster, he went to church. And he heard the gospel. And he accepted Jesus as his Savior. He became profoundly famous for many of his discoveries. But one of the most unique was the peanut. George Washington Carver tells the story on himself. He says, as a young man very much interested in science and in discovering the wonders of our world, I prayed, oh Lord, teach me about the universe. And I heard no stirring in my soul or I heard no voice speak back, but suddenly I felt the impression from God and he was saying to me, George, that's too much for you. Pray for less. He said, okay, Lord. If you won't show me the wonders of the universe, then Lord, teach me all about the world. And again, there was silence. And then I felt an impression that God was telling me, George, that's still too much. You can't handle that. Ask for something you can handle. 
And he thought, and he said, well, I don't know. I really want to discover our world, and I want to, want to find out how our world operates. And that, but what, what, can I, what can I learn? And he looked over, and there was a little bowl of peanuts. And he said, Lord, teach me about the peanut. And he said he felt within his spirit, the Holy Spirit saying, now, George, you've got something you can handle. George Washington Carver went on to discover 144 uses for the peanut, including not only how it can be used as food, but how it can be used medicinally and how it can be used in crop rotation to refertilize uh, the crops for other items. And now, George, you've got something you can handle. It's your size. 144 ways to use the peanut medicinally, agriculturally, and as a food. God's generous nature in answering prayer was the testimony of Carver. Remember George Mueller, the man I told you about, was crossing on a steamer to Boston? When he got to America, he made a tour of several churches, and at one of them, someone asked him, Mr. Mueller, why don't you keep a reserve fund? He was telling them about how when he had a need, he prayed, and God answered his prayer. Mr. Mueller, why don't you keep a reserve fund? That would be the smart business thing to do, to which George Mueller replied, if I did that, I'd quit praying, and God's too good. Well, what do we get from all this today? I'd like to leave us with four thoughts as we bring this to a conclusion. Number one, none of us should have a feeble prayer life. Absolutely none of us. We should know as Christian people a generous God. The same God who filled the vessels for the widow in Elisha's day is the same God who became known as the Lord Jesus Christ and walked this earth and fed the 5,000. That is the same God who stilled the storms. That is the same God who rules our world. The God of Daniel, the God of Noah, the God of Peter and James and the God of John is our God as well. And he is a generous God. So first of all, let us remember God is generous. The second lesson I'd like for us to remember is that we can converse with him. Lord, we are perishing. Yeah, maybe you are. But since you've prayed, and since I'm generous, I will act for you. And he stills the storm. God is generous. We can converse with him. We need to develop an attitude of prayer, that is, make it a habit. And lastly, I want us to remember from James chapter 4, verse 2. You have not because you ask not. Ask, and you shall find, and it will be given. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. You have not because you ask not. James 4, 2. Don't. Be reluctant. Don't be afraid to ask God. He doesn't always answer in the way we would hope, but he always does answer. Augustine, now known as Saint Augustine by most people. In the 400s was a brilliant child. Everyone noticed his brilliant mind. He was extremely gifted and able to learn quickly, and his recall power was tremendous. And so when he got to be a young man, he decided he would go to the pinnacle of educational opportunities. He would go to Rome. 
and in Italy, and he would study the classics and receive the world-class education that his mind deserved. Only one problem, Augustine was a notoriously sinful person, and his mother was a Christian. Monica was her name. And she prayed for him every day. And when she learned of his desire to go to Rome, knowing that that city was full of debauchery, she just knew he would fall in with the wrong people, that he would ruin his life. And she prayed, Lord, I want Augustine to be saved. And I want him to stay here in North Africa. I don't want him to go to Rome. Lord, I want him to be saved. And I want him to stay here in North Africa. I don't want him to go to Rome. Well, he got on the boat and sailed for Italy. And as she watched him go and cross the horizon, she just knew for certain she would never see him again. But the interesting thing is when he got to Italy, he heard about a Bishop Ambrose who had dynamic sermons full of rich content up in the city of Milan. So he decided, well, I'm going to go meet this Bishop Ambrose. I want to hear him speak. I want to see if he's smarter than me. So he made the trip to Milan, and sure enough, he met a bishop who was just as smart as Augustine and who knew his theology. And so Augustine began challenging him and Ambrose had the answers. And they went back and forth for about two years until finally Augustine realized Jesus Christ is the Savior, and he's the Savior I need. And he became a Christian. He accepted Christ as a Savior. In reflecting upon his mother's prayer, Monica had prayed, Lord, I want my boy to be saved, and I don't want him to go to Italy. Keep him here in North Africa. In reflecting upon her prayers, Augustine writes this in his confessions. What she asked for was denied, but what she hoped for was granted. What she asked for specifically was denied. But the true intent of her prayer and the true motive of her prayer and the true desire of her spirit was that her son would be saved. <coughs> and what she hoped for was granted. Why was this granted? Because God is generous. So begin praying to him today. Let us pray. <clears throat> and you'll excuse me while I get a little drink here. Dear Father, today we are grateful to be able to open our Bibles to Second Kings 4 and to learn of how generous God can be to one who believes. To one who believes, to one who prays, to one who is willing to give God the glory, as Elisha was and as this widow was. We see other instances in this, the scripture. Jesus commands us to pray. Jesus modeled prayer. We are told we have not because we ask not. We see instances in the lives of other Christians. George Mueller, Charles Spurgeon, and even in our own day and time, amongst leaders of the Christian faith, Billy Graham and others, Lord, teach us to pray. That was the request of the disciples. May that be our request as well. And then may we do it. Remind us that prayer is conversing with God, who is, through the Holy Spirit, always present with us. Lord, may we learn to pray. And as we do so, may we always keep in mind that our God is generous. Let us stand together for the last song, and if you have a need this morning and you'd care to respond, Dick Westfall
and uh, Tim and Lou Slater are at the front to meet you. If you're here and you know not Christ, if you're here and you have a prayer need, if you're here and you'd like to become part of our church, then simply walk to the front and let them deal with you. Before we sing this last song, I just want to read from Psalms 34. It says, I will praise the Lord at all times. I will constantly speak his praises. I will boast only in the Lord and let all who are helpless take heart. Come and let us tell of the Lord's greatness. Let us exalt his name together. I prayed to the Lord and he answered me. He freed me from all my fears. Those who look to him for help will be radiant with joy. No shadow of shame will darken their faces. In my desperation, I prayed and the Lord listened. He saved me from all my troubles. For the angel of the Lord is a guard. He surrounds and defends all who fear him. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh, the joys of those who take refuge in him. Fear the Lord, you, his godly people. For those who fear him will have all they need. Even strong young lions sometimes go hungry. But those who trust in the Lord will lack no good thing. So we sing this next song. If we can take it as our as our week's uh, mission that yes I will in the darkest hour sing for joy that will trust in Christ that will praise him and I count on one thing the same God that never fails will not fail me now you won't fail me now in the waiting the same god who's never late is working all things out you're working all things out yes i will lift you high in the lowest valley yes i will bless your name My heart is heavy all my days. Oh, yes, I will. Let's sing it together. I count on one thing. Count on one thing. The same God that never fails will not fail me. Glorify, glorify the name of all names. Nothing can stand against, and I choose to praise. To glorify, glorify the name of all names. And nothing can stand against, and I choose to praise. To glorify, glorify the name of all names.
As you leave today, if you'd like to make an offering to our church, there are offering boxes, one in the direct center of the sanctuary toward the back and one at the two side exits to the west. So you may make a contribution by depositing that into our offering box. Between now and next Sunday, invite someone to church with you. They'll appreciate being invited. And don't worry about masks. We've got them available. Uh, Let us pray, and we'll bring our service to a close. Lord, remind us in these days of your generous nature, because you are a good God and a giving God. For you so loved the world that you gave your only begotten Son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. And in giving a gift so grand and so great as the Lord Jesus, nothing we would ask could compare. So may we know you are a generous God and you invite us to bring our prayer needs before you. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, may the love of God the Father, and may the communion of the Holy Spirit rest and abide upon us all till our Savior come and evermore. Amen. God bless you all. You are dismissed. Mm